Welcome to Books and Booze, a bookish and wine and juice podcast from two book lovers who have never met. That is the power of the internet. We're your hosts. I am Jade. And I'm Kiara. And today we have a very special guest, Chris Hammer, author of the fantastic new Australian crime fiction novel, Scrublands, which last week was number one fiction in Australia. Thank you so much for joining us on Books and Booze. It really means a lot to us. You were our first author to come on to Books and Booze, so it, it's very special to us. And as tradition, we love to pair our episodes in the books that we read with wine. So what epi- what book did you choose to pair your book, Scrublands, with? You mean what wine did I choose to pair it with? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, you said which book do I want to pair it with? I thought I'd just stick Sorry, with Scrublands if that's all right. <laughs> I have a wine here. <laughs> um, it's called Styx. It's a Yarrow Valley Chardonnay, and I chose it because it had a picture of dry sticks on it because I was under the impression we were doing a video. Um, I've got no. <laughs> what I really should have got is a really dry wine. I've got no idea whether it's dry or not, but I might just have a taste and see how it goes. Okay, yes. <laughs> I'm actually amazed at how... Yeah, that's yeah, great. So many wines in Australia are actually screw tops and not corked. Can you hear that? Um, Australia invented the screw top. Oh, really? The Australian wine industry, I yeah. I had no idea. And it had a great deal of resistance yeah. from the Europeans to start with. Yeah. You guys teach me something every day. <laughs> <laughs> What, oh, that's a bad face from Chris. Is it not good? <laughs> it's a taste of white nectarine, poached pear, almond milled, textural winemaking. There you go. Okay. Uh, it's it's oh. not bad. It'd be, be better chilled, I suspect. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. maybe get some ice in it. <laughs> <laughs> not sure the winemakers would approve of that either. <laughs> I'm from South Africa, <laughs> like anything goes. <laughs> so, Kiara, what are you drinking? You? Uh, well, I <laughs> I was actually in hospital over the weekend, so I am strictly on the waters um, because I'm on some strong antibiotics. But water is good as well for scrublands because Martin does drink a lot of water in the book. Yes, he keeps lots of water. It's very, very hot. In the boot of his car. He drinks bottled water because the water in the town is almost undrinkable, which can happen (laughs) in the drought. It has been said that Adelaide is one of the only two major cities in the world where ships refuse to take on water. Because by the time it gets to the end of the Murray River, particularly in the time of drought, it is almost undrinkable as it's got to have so much chemicals in it to kill all the bugs. Yikes. Let's not dwell oh, on thank that. Thank you. Well, no. Yeah. Nope. It sounds very much like where I'm from in South Africa. They're going through huge water crises at the moment. Uh, yeah, I think the water was supposed to get cut off uh, in April or something. Is that like Cape Town? Yeah. 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 So, but tonight, uh, not getting on to depressing topics about uh, um, water shortages. Um, I am drinking the McWilliams 2017 Shiraz off the press, which I can show you guys on camera. It looks very cool. And it like the label is really nice because it's got like a journalist, like newspaper print on the front, which I thought was very apt for this episode because our main character, Martin, is a journalist. So I like that. And also, it's it's very dry, like a Shiraz is known to be dry, so I thought it paired very well with the book. And it's just very aromatic and spicy and flavoursome wine, and it's super affordable, it's like $12, so. Very good. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Chris, we um, would, you, would you mind telling us a little bit like the premise of Scrublands, just so the, the listeners can get a feel for your book? Absolutely. So here's the setup. We're in this very small, isolated country town called Riversend. It's way out on the Hay Plain. Anyone who's driven, say, between Sydney or Canberra and Adelaide will know it. It's dead flat. There are no trees. You you can practically see the curvature of the earth. The land is so flat. And that's in a good season. This is not a good season. It's gripped by drought. We're outside the church and the congregation is gathering for the once fortnightly church service. 
the young priest, name of Byron Swift, is there, mingling with the congregation, uh, laughing, um, just talking normally. Everything seems perfectly normal. He then goes into his church to change into his vestments, comes out about 10 minutes later, dressed in his robes, crucifix round his neck with a high-powered rifle, and he proceeds to shoot five members of the congregation dead. That's the start of the book. That's the prologue. The story proper starts a year later. Our protagonist, Martin Scarsden, a journalist, who's carrying his own demons with him, has been sent to the town to write a rather simple story. The story is just to see how the town is coping with these traumatic events a year on. But the longer he stays in the town, the more he begins to suspect that the accepted wisdom of why the priest shot the uh, members of his congregation, he begins to suspect that is wrong. And the more he delves into it, the more secrets of the town he uncovers. Sounds so brilliant. I don't know. It gets you. The prologue gets you, pulls you in, and you cannot stop yeah, writing. Yeah, Alan and Un Unwin sent me my copy, and I got it signed by Chris when I met him, and I just, I love it so much. It's brilliant. Yeah, we both really, really Thank enjoyed you. it. Yeah. I, as soon as I finished reading it, I told my sister-in-law, like, you have to read it. It's amazing. And she's loving it. She's like, yeah. why do I have to work? I don't want to work. I just want to read the book. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I, I've got so many people in England and America that love Australian crime fiction in particular. And I've just been like, Scrublands, do it. <laughs> oh, good on you. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> So um, what inspired you to write the story? One of our listeners, Jade underscore 1292, asked what inspired the change from environmental nonfiction to fiction? Have you always wanted to write fiction, even in your journalism? Yeah, I think I always wanted to write fiction. Uh, never really had the opportunity. Didn't really have the confidence to write fiction, strangely enough. Journalism, I guess, is there's a safety net. You're reporting the facts. Also, your language is the simpler the better um, and, and also you have the assignment you have the deadline you don't need the kind of self-discipline whatever but I think there was always part of me that wanted to write fiction um, and now I have written fiction let me tell you I find it really liberating and I love doing it it's really enjoyable um, and I kind of wish oh, or wonder uh, why did I leave it so long but um, nevertheless, <laughs> no, no, I, it, it is, and probably bits of my journalistic experience have helped me write fiction, and perhaps other parts have impeded it a, a little bit. <laughs> okay. Well, the writing is amazing in it. The way you set oh. the scene for the Australian uh, narrative, it's it, amazing. Yeah, it just transports you right into that drought-stricken area in Australia. It's, it's incredibly done. Um, when I met you at the Avid Reader Bookshop, I loved how you spoke about Martin as your main character. So from other authors that I've met and mingled with in the past, they they all kind of spoke about their main characters like they were almost real people, you know? Like they said, oh yeah, they, they just spoke to me and they took their story their own way. Did you feel the same way about Martin? Like he, he spoke to you throughout the story? For sure. So the, the way the, re the book is written you have the prologue that scene i just described with the priest shooting the parishioners the story proper the book proper starts after that two pages mm -hmm. in and martin is our protagonist this double this this um, damaged journalist and he's in every scene and it's not told in the first person it's t the story's conveyed in the third person but it's really told through Martin's eyes. So we can see inside his head, we can see what he's thinking. None of the other characters uh, are like that. And so, yeah, he's the person who carries us through. And he did change a lot as I wrote the book and rewrote and did various variations of the book. And one of the things that I wanted to do with it is to have a kind of a nuanced character, a character who wasn't necessarily all good it has his flaws, has his faults, but also, cha also, also changes 
during the um, during the narrative. So the Martin Scarston that finishes the book is a different man than Martin Scarston who begins the book. Okay. Yeah, no, he's he's such a charismatic guy. You know, he's so flawed, and he's got like a lot of self confidence issues, I think, as well. But where did that come from? Like the self confidence issues. Well, I didn't want him to be like a perfect detective. You know, that's a you know the old sort of Miss Marple. You know, always astute, always right, always morally pure. Okay, so I wanted him more damaged. I wanted him to have some emotional baggage. But I also wanted him to just, like, get things wrong. So you often mm. get maybe a protagonist, a hero, who may be damaged or flawed, but they tend to still get things right most of the time. Martin not only gets things wrong, at times he gets them spectacularly wrong, uh, which, which has consequences because he reports some of the things that he gets wrong in the newspaper and then has to suffer the consequences of that. So that's the idea yeah. I started with, you know, someone, it's not just the reader who might jump to the wrong conclusion, which often happens in crime books, but the actual people in the crime books are jumping to the wrong conclusions too. Um, so that's the idea I started with, but as it went along, yes, he be he and other characters in the book took on a life of their own. And so you might have some plot points set out, oh, this happens, this happens, this happens. But when you actually get to write it out in full, you go, no, that can't happen because that character wouldn't do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I remember you saying that your your book differs from others in your genre when I saw you at the Avid Reader bookshop. You said, you know, there wasn't the, it, it wasn't, just like, okay, that's the bad guy and that's the story. Like, so how, how do you think that your book differs in its genre? Well, um, I'm not sure that that's right. I think there are books where there's kind of good guys, bad guys, kind of cardboard cutout characters, if you like, and the, and the books are very plot driven. There's nothing wrong with that. That's one way of writing and one and there are some readers who really like that, just a purely plot-driven book. I wanted mm -hmm. more nuance in the characters, so many of the characters, not just Martin, but other characters in the book, aren't necessarily goodies or baddies. They've got good elements to them, they've got bad elements to it, to them. And I just think that, for me, if I was reading, that's something that I would enjoy. So when writing the book, yeah. the kind of the test was, one of the tests was, would I enjoy reading this book? Yeah. yeah. Well, they're human. They're, that's actually something that I wrote down, that all your characters are very human, very, like, genuine. You could imagine actually meeting these people. Yeah, they're raw. It's very well character developed. Yeah. yeah. They're real, real people. So, so on characters, staying on characters, who is your favourite to write? Because I personally, I really enjoyed Kodja. I bet you he was a blast to write. Yeah, a lot of people like Codger, actually, who's this old man who lives out in, in, the, in the scrublands, as it happens. But most of them, actually, I quite like writing. Some, some are, of course, a little bit confronting and disturbing. But, no, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure I've got a particular favourite. It is interesting, though, as yep. I've gone around and talked to people, quite a lot of people like Codger. But then there's other a bookseller I ran in today liked one of the policemen and I know my wife liked another of the policemen and yeah. um, and it's interesting the, um, the crossover of the readers, the gender of the reader doesn't seem to matter. Like some, some people yeah. like say um, Mandalay Blonde who's, who's the, probably the... I the, love her. Yeah, so, so some people like her, it's, so it's a, it's, I, which I find, of course, is quite a compliment that people like different characters. Yeah. yeah. Well, it just proves that they're also well Yeah, Yeah, like Mandalay Blonde is the lady that has a little boy and she works in a bookshop. Her dad is supposedly a rapist and she's just got such an amazing backstory and I think that she's a really strong character like, from, from the beginning of the book. One, one of the characters that people typically probably don't like, but because 
he remains a kind of mystery pretty much to the end is the priest himself so he's committed this oh, book yeah. isn't a who done it it's a kind of why done it because you're right you know right from the word right, go yeah. that the priest has shot um five people dead and, and you learn fairly quickly in the story that he himself was then shot dead by the local policeman so he's gone but there's witnesses so everyone knows that he's killed the people and the question is why he did and what martin yeah. finds is in the town there are people who are still despite this horrific act of murder there are still people who remember him fondly and more or less defend him and so one of the questions is there for the reader is is this guy a bad guy or is this guy a good guy or is he some sort of weird mix of the two and that's i think part of the appeal for, at least for some readers of the book is going to be is going to be pondering what was driving the priest yeah it's it's definitely a good one yes um, so if you could describe Scrublands in three adjectives, what would you choose and why? Adjectives? Oh, I don't know. Can I use nouns? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, death. Uh, despair. Redemption. That's perfect. Okay, and what about yourself? If you had to describe yourself in three adjectives, what would what would they be? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got no idea. Rather happy at the moment, I must say, because the way the book is going. Yeah, we've been we've been oh, seeing like you on a, social media. <laughs> yeah, it's like a dream come true. Seriously, I think. Cheers to that. You know, it's like every writer's dream to write a book that has been, you know, so well received. Um, so right now, yeah. Everyone, everyone is embracing yeah, it. Isn't yeah. So they? three oh. words at the moment are probably happy, happy, and happy. Yeah, oh, that's great. <laughs> well, just to keep like the the giggling flowing, I think uh, Kiara's got a pretty funny question oh. that she wants to ask you. Uh oh. So this one, this one came from my husband. He's a bit cheeky. Um, <laughs> Um, and so I, I messaged him and he was asking me what I was doing and I said, oh, I'm working on the uh, questions for Chris Hammer. So he said he has one for you. So he said, to pump yourself up when you're writing, do you ever listen to stop hammer time to set the mood? No, no. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of hammer related music though, if you start to think about it. But no, I do, I do often listen to music while I'm writing. I'm not... One of the benefits of being a, a, a journalist for so many years, I'm not easily distracted. So you get writers who, who absolutely yeah. need quiet and some classical music and some incense and not this stuff. I can pretty much write anywhere. So on the yeah. train or, yeah. um, you know, in a cafe or whatever. But yeah, sometimes music I find really helps. So what yeah. sort of... What, what yeah. do you listen to? I often just sort of pick up random internet radio stations. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, which probably indicates how um, how I don't get easily distracted. Yeah, because that could go either way. You could find some pearlers and you could find some atrocious stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I don't, like, not typically, sometimes classical, but not typically, usually just some sort of pop music. Probably more acoustic than head banging, but you know, occasionally, who knows? Yeah. Okay. So for a debut novel, Scrublands is beautifully chunky. I'm holding my copy at the moment. Um, how long did it take for you to write it? Yeah, so it's about 125,000 words, which is often publishers like books around 80 or 90,000 words. So it is a bit longer maybe than the typical book. Um, although Alan and Unwin never wanted to cut back, I must say, and neither of the um, international publishers either. Um, it took, I started, I think, about five years ago. But to say it took me five years to write is probably somewhat misleading in it. You know, I had a full-time demanding job, family responsibilities, etc. So it was a matter of getting it to it when I had a few bit of spare time. The other thing is 
there were major rewrites. Like I threw out the second half of the book twice, so there's probably it'd be well over a hundred thousand words that just sort of hit the bin, sort of thing. So I'm I'm really hoping that doesn't happen again with my next book, which I'm working on now. So, but yeah, I, I I started about five years away, uh, five years ago. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things I love the most about it is that. There's, so for me, because I'm not from Australia, it's got so much Aussie lingo in it that I found so fascinating. Like, so I'm not used to calling a ute a ute. To me, it's called a bucky in South Africa. <laughs> um, a bucky, okay. Uh, a buggy? A bucky. A bucky. <laughs> um, and like, just, just the different words that people say, like grog for alcohol and all sorts <laughs> of things that you said in this book. Like, I just like, I found myself smiling so much at the aussie of it all. I just, I loved it. But could you follow it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. I've got an Aussie boyfriend or an Aussie partner. So, um, oh. yep, he's, he's been teaching me the lingo. So. <laughs> okay, so, so here's, the inter- here's the interesting thing about that. So when I'm writing it, um, I, of course, I had the ambition to get it published, but I always was thinking, you know, my experience with the non-fiction books was, yeah, I'll find a publisher, it, you know, with a bit of luck, it'll be good enough, it'll get published. So I never had any idea that it would ever stand a chance of being published, you know, say in the US or the UK. So in writing it, I made no compromises for a foreign audience. And now, lo and behold, it has been picked up by publishers in the US and the UK. And I've just been working through the US edit. So the interesting thing is they've been really respectful of the Allen and Unwin edit. So there's, there's no substantial changes at all. That's good. But the interesting thing is how willing they've been to accept the Australian vernacular and other images. They didn't understand Ute either, so Ute's going to be truck mm. or pickup truck. And there's a few yeah, truck, yeah. there's a few minor things like um, meters become yards, and the mm. boot of the of the car becomes a trunk. Trunk, yeah. But <laughs> a lot of a lot of words they accepted, a lot of images they accepted. Um, for example. They said, oh, chayaking, we don't understand what chayaking is, but hey, we like the word, so we're going to keep it in there. <laughs> and I just, so going through, said, there's an allusion there, just a paragraph to yeah. Martin, and I'm drawing a kind of parallel with the game of cricket. Okay, so American readers aren't going to understand it, but there's no attempt to edit that out. So the, that's great. The difference is, I think, whereas even 10 years ago, you would struggle to get an Australian book published in the United States. Or if you did, it would, it would be radically modified in language. So, you know, you, you, your cricket analogy would be changed to a baseball one or something like that. I think there's been a real yeah. wind change in the United States where they're accepting of, so Australian books, so books like Jane Harper's books and Sarah Bailey's and Candace Fox. So there's a whole bunch of books there that have been demonstrated can be popular in the US. So the publishers have are now understanding the readers will take that. I think it probably goes back a step further to maybe um, say Scandi Noir, that that, that, that yeah. the American publishers learnt that, that crime stories in particular set mm-hmm. in foreign locations wasn't a disadvantage. If anything, it's a bit exotic or something like that. So it's been really interesting in doing this American edit, just how little they want to change. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. really good. That's what yeah, you absolutely. want. Yeah, absolutely. Because they, I mean, they, they don't often change books to come over here and we manage to still be transported into that mm-hmm. world and no exactly. issues. Yeah. And I feel that, so uh, we've both read Jane Harper's book, The Dry, and we both loved it. And I, um, I said to Kiara that... I feel like she is the Australian equivalent of um, Joe Nesbo's Scandi novel, um, you know, like The Snowman or something, you know, like his uh, Harry Hall series. I feel like Jane Harper is the Aussie equivalent. Um, but I, I do have to say a very naughty, sneaky thing that I am actually enjoying your book just a little bit more. <laughs> well, I love I, it. 
I think summary, you know, the, they're both set, murder mysteries set in small towns during the drought. Yeah. But that's a little bit like saying a Scandi noir book has got snow in it. <laughs> I do, so I tend to think <laughs> people who like to dry will tend to like scrublands mm. and vice versa. But depending on the predilections of the reader, they might yeah. like prefer one to, to another. Because in some ways they're similar, but in other ways they're quite different books. Yeah. I yeah. feel like your... I don't know what it is. Like I think your book just for me had different subplots that I really enjoyed you know they they had those quirky sideline characters that were wonderful to get to know and I just I just really enjoyed all those little different elements of the book there were so many little subplots that were just so fascinating and you wanted to uncover everything about the book and all the characters oh thank you (laughs) pleasure yeah you can tell you put your heart and soul yes it's a great thing to do I really like I like the process. I'm, I'm proud of the book, but I actually like just sitting down and writing it. Sometimes it can be such a joy. <laughs> um, so throughout the book, Martin is obsessed with his hands and other people's hands. So what is that a metaphor for? Um, I'm going to leave that up to you and the readers. So it's Ooh. not necessary... You know, it's not an integral part of the book, so you don't have to know or work it out. But there's some things there that are probably best left unsaid by me. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So I kind of found that very similar to, I don't know if you guys have read um, Shantaram by, is it Gregory David Roberts? No, I haven't. uh... You haven't? Okay. So... Um, I won't go into details, but he's quite, that author is very obsessed with eyes. Uh, I noticed that throughout his book. And I put it down to the fact that the author had been in, in jail for such a long time. And, you know, when he could finally see people again, it was just such a a joy and a wonderful thing to be able to look people in the eyes again. Um, And that's kind of what I thought about it. So I'd love to think more about why Martin loves hands so much because I think every little bit about a person's quirky personality is so special okay I'm gonna leave it to you though (laughs) (laughs) okay well um so I'm an aspiring author myself um so I'm just I'm really interested to to know how did you like if you have you ever had writer's block and if you have how have you gotten over it so I think writer's block in some ways is a misnomer. I, in part, probably having been a journalist for so long, I'm used to not waiting for inspiration. You know, you just you just write. And in fact, writing creatively, writing fiction, I find sometimes I really don't feel like writing. I've had a late night, there's something troubling me, whatever. And yet, after I begin writing, often that's when some of the best things come, you know, some of the, the best ideas occur to me. So part of it is just the discipline of, of writing all the day, uh, every day. In fact, you get to the point where it's a bit like, you know, if you're a gym junkie or a, a jogger or something, that you feel sort of bad if you haven't done any writing in a particular day. However, Having said that, some days I know where I am, the story's going well, and I'll write thousands of words. Other days I might write almost nothing. But I don't see those days as being less productive or that I've got writer's block. It's just that something isn't working and I need to think it through. So in the end result, the time spent, there might be as many words put down on the page or on the screen but it is just as product in the end result those times might be more valuable when you know what you're going to write so also if you've embarked on a novel there's always something to think about and contemplate and work through Um, so I've never really suffered from writer's block but I imagine it would come right at the beginning of a project when you're unsure about what you should be writing you know you're still trying to work out should i write you know a gothic novel or a horror story or a comedy or a screenplay or you know whatever 
But as I say, even that's not is time probably well spent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, who are some some authors that inspire you? Look, the, <laughs> I'm not necessarily as widely read as you or many of your readers. That's the first <laughs> thing to say. The second thing is, I'm not really a crime <laughs> tragic. This is a crime book, and I like I like crime, and but it, you know. I've met people and been interviewed by people who are just, they don't read anything save crime. I actually quite like um, yeah. literary books to, to some degree. I do like crime books. I always liked the old hardball detective books I discovered maybe in my 20s, you know, so Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler type books. The ones that many of your listeners would know from, you know, the Humphrey Bogart movies, those classic noir sort of movies that are typically set on those books. Um, the Australian writer Peter Temple, I like very much because he takes crime books and particularly in his last couple of books, extends the, the format so it's so much more than just a straight, you know, airport book. You know, Truth Truth won the Miles Franklin and genre books typically don't win a literary prize of that type of standing unless they've got something else to them, including, you know, in his case, fine writing, but also great characterisation and also some kind of uh, profound explorations of ethical issues. Um, so that's a lot of the appeal of writing crime type books to me because I think you need a plot I think you've got to have a good plot and you can't get away from that but on top of that there's a room for so much more particularly the psychological exploration of character yeah okay so um, for me going back to just quickly and then we'll get into the boozy banter which is kind of where we end off the episode um, okay. so I just want to know um, you said when I met you at avid reader that once upon a time you were you were more in love with the idea of being a writer than you were of writing so how and when did that change because I think that's what I am going through myself at the moment and I want to get to the stage where you're at where you know you're you've written something and you're getting so successful yeah I you know as a young person um, you know at high school and then at uni I did English and literature and whatever and you know of course you read all the great writers and you and you admire the work so much and think oh wouldn't it be terrific to be like that and probably oh wouldn't it be nice to be admired like you know I admired them um, and somehow that washed out because the, tr the trouble with that is you don't think about the writing you think about what you want the writing, where you want the writing to take you, you know, in, in your career or something. So to put that a, a different way, to bring it forward, I think it's a great mistake, say, if you're writing genre fiction or commercial fiction to think, I'm going to write a bestseller. Because what you do then is you, is you go, I'm going to write a bestseller, what's a bestseller? And you look at other writers and you try and emulate them. And you end yep. up being as like a, a, a poor copy of that. And one of the problems, more in the case, if you want to be a more literary writer, so I want to write a literary book, and you write a book that is designed, or you, where you're trying to impress people, you're trying to impress the readers, or maybe impress judges for prizes. You know, you, you're, so, so you're not writing from the heart, as it were, and typically you might find, oh, I want to do that, but it's so hard actually writing. You don't, maybe you find you don't actually like the process of writing. And I think the way I worked through, through that is I found that I just like writing. I like making up a good story. So that's what I'm, so when I'm writing or when I was writing Scrublands, I wasn't thinking of any kind of reception from publishers for example I wasn't thinking oh I'm going to write this sort of book because a publisher will like it and publish it or an agent will accept it I was just thinking I'm just going to write a good book a book that I wouldn't mind reading 
if someone else gave it to me, I'm just going to work. And lo and behold, I found myself enjoying it. And then I was, that, that's not to say that, I, you know, I didn't have a reader in mind in that, oh, would that make sense to a reader or could I make that work better for a reader? Certainly there was that element. But really, because I was concentrating on just doing it well, I found I enjoyed it more. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for the advice. Because one, one fine day... I don't know. Does that um, make sense to you? Yes. No, it does. Uh, and Yeah, you wrote, wrote for yourself. You yeah. You writing for everyone else. That's what you need to do. You've got to believe in your own story and your own work. And you've got to just think, I'm going to try and write a good book. And, you know, if it doesn't get published, you know, who cares? And... Yeah. You know, at, yeah. At the end of the day, it's still an accomplishment. You still written a book, and, and it's really, also yeah. it's also part of a process. So, the process being that I want to become a good writer. So I've got I've written one book. I'm very proud of it. I think it's a very good book, but I don't want it to be the best book <laughs> I write. I want to go and write yeah. books that, yeah. and maybe some will be better, some will be worse, and hopefully there will be a somewhat upwards mm -hmm. trajectory. <laughs> I've, I, this is, I'm on, it, I'm on my fourth book at the moment that I'm busy writing and I, they're, they're not edited or anything. So it's a long way to go for all of them. But one, one thing I can say is that through time and reading more books and just, you know, just taking more time and not being rushed when I was younger, like I was like, it's so much, I can see such a development and a maturation in my, in my writing. Yeah, well, good. So, You're on an excellent oh, path then. Yeah. So, yeah, I just think it's wonderful to to be able to just take that time for yourself. And so I think that leads us on to the boozy banter. So we always end our episodes with boozy banter, which is basically us talking about what we're enjoying, whether it be movies or Netflix or music or books and traveling and you've been doing heaps of traveling lately so tell us a bit about like what what you've been loving at the moment and we'll go from there okay so one thing I've been really enjoying is reading a lot so I had this idea when I was writing well first I didn't have hardly any spare time and so writing was basically taking the time that I might have spent reading but on top of that I was a bit worried that I would lose my voice or I'd get infected by some other writer's voice so I sort of stopped writing. In retrospect I don't think that was true I don't think it would have happened but that's how it did happen so once I finished I started reading and I've got a lot of reading to catch up with so I've been reading lots of um, lots of Australian novels basically crime novels and other novels and a little bit of non-fiction. So that's one thing I've really enjoyed. Um, traveling around promoting the book is actually quite enjoyable too. I've done just, August is a, is a month where there's a few writers festivals. So I went to the Byron Bay Writers Festival and then the Bendigo Writers Festival and going to the Canberra Writers Festival next weekend. That's um, where you live, right? That's where I live. So um, that's really enjoyable I, and just, engaging and talking to other writers and um, and meeting meeting writers including some who are really at the top of their game so at Byron Bay I was lucky enough to meet uh, Michael Robotham and uh, Anne Cleves who's the author of you know the Vera books and the Shetland books so you know these are major international crime writers so it was very privileged to sort of meet them one-on-one -on -one and sort of you know discuss the craft Wow. So where's the best place that you've been just since your book's been released? Like where's been the most enjoyable uh, I, place and the most exposure for your book where people have been so excited? Well, I'm not sure about th that part of it, but Byron Bay was very enjoyable because I live in yeah. Canberra and it's freezing. And I go to Byron Bay <laughs> and I can swim in the sea. So yeah, that, uh, and, and and there were some very good parties there too, if you're talking about books and booze. Well, that's Byron Bay. It's books, well, but there's also there a lot yet. of booze. 
I'm. I just <laughs> Byron Bay is beautiful. You have. Yeah. To I go, just go. bought a car, and I'm planning on doing a trip, hopefully in the next months. So I'll get there eventually. I'm slowly working my way through Australia. <laughs> well, if you're in Brisbane, it's not far to go. No, exactly. But what about you, Kiara? <laughs> what are you enjoying at the moment? Um, because I've been a little bit unwell, I haven't had a huge amount of downtime, but I am finishing up Good Me, Bad Me by <gasps> Alan Land, which is, I'm not going to say anything because I think we'll save it for another episode. I am enjoying it. Safe and she's that. coming on to and the podcast I... too. So she's a, another yes. author that will be joining us. She's amazing. Um, and, and then I watched Set It Up on Netflix, which is just a kind of cheesy, sweet movie, but I couldn't really concentrate on anything over the weekend. So it was nice to just put on. Yeah. Oh, I mean, we've recorded a few episodes, so we, I don't think we've really been um, able to enjoy much more than we've spoken about in previous episodes. Uh, so I've literally just been binge watching MasterChef, which, like I said previously, my partner loves because he gets home and I'm scoring salmon and putting all these different ingredients into food <laughs> and <laughs> having a good go in the kitchen. So he loves it. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, I finished The Sinner. Uh, with Jessica Biel on Netflix, which is brilliant, a uh, crime TV show. Um, I'll, have to and look, I, I'll look at that one then. Yeah, that it's it's good. fantastic. So yeah, that's fantastic. We, we did speak about it briefly on the last episode, but just as a quick recap for you, Chris, it's this woman who's on the beach with her husband and her young son, and she gets triggered by this music uh, while she's on the beach, and she just runs over and she stabs this guy in the neck and the heart and his face and everywhere and just mutilates him until he dies uh and she uh she gets sent to jail obviously and is accused of murdering him and then it's it's i think it's about eight episodes nine episodes of just unraveling the case and why she did what she did but she's got she yeah she's got no memory of her past and but something triggered her and that's what this Netflix show is revealing and it's it got a little bit weird at the end for me with one or two little things I won't spoil anything um so we finished it last night me and Mark and it got a little bit strange but overall we loved it and we just heard that season two is coming out soon so good so, a bit like Scrublands a bit like Scrublands though you know everyone saw her do it yes why did she yeah do it? Yes. yeah it's good that sounds it's... like it. there's another good one on Netflix oh, I, I saw a while back it. called um Hotel Beau Sejour, uh, which is, oh, it's like oh. a Dutch um, one. And it's a young woman that's been murdered and she kind of uh, more or less comes back to life or she feels she has. So she's trying to work out who killed her. Self. It sounds oh. a bit weird, but it's very effectively done. Okay. Well, it sounds good. We'll add that. Um, we always link it for our listeners yeah uh, we'll link it. No, and we one. just finished our netflix show so we're looking for something new so we'll probably dive into that tonight <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on to the podcast chris we we really appreciate it okay thanks jade and thanks kiara and good luck yeah. with, and good thank luck you. with your writing jade and kiara are you working on something um not at the moment i've got two little uh Boys. Oh, so okay. that and the podcast and a regular job keeps me quite busy <laughs> at the moment. Absolutely. But uh, you never, never say never. <laughs> well, it could be good experience. Exactly. <laughs> but thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we wish you all the best. And this podcast should be out in the next couple of days. Um, so yeah, um, we will talk to you soon. Definitely. We'll keep in touch, Chris. Okay, thank you. Make sure you... Um, yep, yeah, thank you. Oh, wait, wait, where can we find you, actually? Like, where, what's your Instagram handle and any other handle that you've got? So I'm on Facebook. I've got two Facebooks. I've got a personal one and a public one, which is Chris Hammer Author on Facebook. Yep. Okay. And on Instagram, I'm The Hammer Now, or one okay. word. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay. And uh, Kiara, where can we find you? Uh, I am on Instagram at, at bookish.kiki. And uh, we, we've got our uh, our general podcast one, which is at uh, books and booze, well, books, booze pod. And then my personal Instagram is boho underscore bookworm. So that's about it. 
that we've got to say for this episode. Thank you very much, Chris. And I hope you guys uh, have an amazing night further and enjoy uh, the wine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye.